meeting is devoted to discussing task four of the Midcoast LCP update project. Specifically, task four calls for reevaluating whether the existing annual residential growth limit of 125 units per year should be lowered and by how much. In terms of background, the existing LCP manages the rate of residential growth by limiting the number of new dwelling units per year to 125 units per year. However, the Board of Supervisors may raise the limit up to 200 units upon finding that infrastructure capacity is sufficient to accommodate the additional growth. The 125 uh, unit limit was established to ensure that new development occurred gradually and not create a boom town environment nor overburden schools, infrastructure, and natural resources. The limit was developed in 1980 by dividing the number of vacant parcels yet to be developed at that time by a 30 year planning period. As such, 125 dwelling units per year was considered to be gradual growth, a gradual growth rate uh, toward mid coast build out. In actuality, since 1981, the number of new residential units has averaged 52 units per year. That is less than half of the 125 which are permitted. And this has been primarily due to varying economic conditions and limits on the availability of water and sewage capacity. Sewerage capacity. Infrastructure availability also affects where new development is located. For example, approximately 90% of all new mid-coast residences that were built in the late 1990s were solely located in Miramar and El Granada, um, where during this period sufficient sewer and water capacity was available. The rate of growth can affect a community in many ways. The most obvious Im impact of rapid growth is increased traffic volumes. At the last hearing, I discussed the, I discussed the projected traffic congestion uh, that passes will be uh, on highways 1 and 92 through the mid-coast. Lowering the rate of development can slow the annual increase in traffic congestion, thereby affording more time for the community to adjust to build out level traffic. Another impact related to rate of growth is the amount of surface runoff erosion and sedimentation that may occur. Generally, increasing the number of disturbed areas and the amount of impervious surfaces can lead to more, sediment and more sedimentation and runoff. Some community members uh, have cited uh, Miramar as an example where multiple construction projects occurring at the same time increase surface runoff and accelerated flooding and erosion. I should note at this point though that another task, Task 23, has been scheduled for February 11th which includes a proposal to enact impervious surface zoning standards and this could help um, avert some, this could have helped avert some of the outcomes particularly uh, related to runoff and sedimentation. Another impact related to rate of growth is the perceived change in the quality of life. Impacts from, um, from a community under construction include noise, dust, visual clutter, and traffic from heavy vehicles. Some community members have alleged that construction vehicles congregating near job sites have trapped residents in their driveways and damage adjacent uh, property. Um, reducing the rate of development would lower annual construction impacts, but would prolong the amount of time that construction would be occurring in the community up to build out. The rate of development directly affects uh, when community build out will occur. For example, if the average rate of 52 per, per unit, sorry, 52 units per year were to continue, the mid coast build out would occur in 46 years or 2049. However, if the rate of development were to kick up and continue at the permitted 125 units per year, mid-coast build, build would, mid build out would occur in 19 years or 2022. In general, the longer the time taken to reach build out, the less there is a perceived loss of community character or reduced quality of life each year. The opposite is also true. The shorter the time taken to reach build out, the more there is a perceived loss of community character and reduced quality of life each year, and hence less time for the community to adjust to the changes resulting from development. And this leads to the alternative discussed at the community work workshops. And these are on the screen. I'd like to note to everyone in the audience, as well as your commission, that for all of the uh, graphics that, are well, that I'm showing on the screen, I have uh, paper copies, colored paper copies of all the graphics, so if there's a problem seeing the screen, there's copies on the table in the back of the room. 
So, um, at the community workshop, we looked at uh, five alternatives. And as with most of these tasks, the first alternative is the status quo alternative. This would maintain the limit of 125 units per year, and it continue to allow the Board of Supervisors to raise the limit to 200 building permits per year upon making the finding that sufficient infrastructure capacity exists to accommodate the additional growth. Under this alternative, mid-coast build-out would not occur for at least 19 years. The second alternative that we discussed to work at the workshops is what's known as the 30-year build-out alternative. And this would lower the, lower the annual limit from 125 units per year to 80 units per year and delete the provision authorizing the board to raise this limit when infrastructure capacity exists. This alternative um, was based, remember I had said earlier that the, in, in 1980, when the local coast program was originally uh, prepared, the, ninth, the 125 figure was a result of taking the amount of development that's still left to occur and dividing by 30 years, so it was a 30 year planning period. This um, alternative kind of reestablishes the concept of a 30 year planning period, except it would be 30 years from now. And, uh, and, and again, looking at the remaining residential development that would occur and dividing it by 30, and that's how we got the uh, 80 units per year. And so, as the name, would apply, as the name implies, mid-coast build-off would not occur for at least 30 years. The third alternative is what I call the historic growth rate alternative. And this would lower the annual limit to 52 units per year and delete the provision authorizing the board to raise the limit. This alternative reflects the average annual rate of mid-coast housing development since 1981, and build-out would not occur for 46 years. So as I indicated uh, earlier, when we, when we tracked the number of building permits, uh, the uh, number of new units in the mid-coast since the inception of the LCP, and divided by the number of years, the annual average was 52 years, uh, new units a year. Looking at that as the historic growth rate, at least over the past 20 plus years, um, with this alternative would be to continue that. And uh, so it would be lowering, this alternative would lower the limit from 125 to 52. The fourth alternative is what I dubbed the Half Moon Bay, Half Moon Bay based alternative. This alternative would limit, uh, would lower the limit to 1% annual population growth, which is currently uh, based on the population of the Midcoast, would currently be 38 units per year. This alternative reflects the approach that was approved by the Half Moon Bay electorate in a 1999 ballot measure known as Measure D. It would also delete the provision authorizing the board to raise the limit, and mid-coast build-out under this alternative would not occur for 46 years, for at least 46 years. The fifth alternative, I've dubbed it the regional planning alternative, um, would lower the limit to 30 units per year and also delete the provision authorizing the board to raise the limit. This alternative reflects ABAG's growth project projections for the mid-coast between 2000 and 2020, which is 30 units per year. ABAG uh, does this type of analysis for all of the communities in the region, and the projection is derived from a region-wide statistical formula that considers many variables, including birth, death rates, migration, economic productivity, and unemployment. This is not ABAG's need uh, figure for what the need is for residential development or the fair share of housing. What this is, is it's a statistical formula where they look at trends related to migration, birth, death, and where uh, economic centers are and, and things like that, and kind of project where the region will be 20 years from now. The sixth alternative is a little different from all the rest because it can be coupled with all the rest. Um, the sixth alternative is what I call the community distributive alternative. And this is an option that can be combined with any of the other alternatives. The other alternative sets the limit for the mid-coast. What this alternative does, if it was, if uh, your commission endorsed it in tandem with another li uh, limit, we distribute it. So right now we have the mid-coast is allowed 125 new units a year. There is no qualifier that certain amount must go to uh, uh, 
must not be exceeded for El Granada, a certain amount must not be exceeded for Monterra. Theoretically, it could all occur in one area. And as I indicated earlier, in 1995 to 1999, about 89 or 90% did occur only in one area. It was in El Granada and Miramar. So uh, with the community distributed alternative, I indicated this could be combined with any of the other alternatives which set the numeric limit. What this alternative does is divide up and distribute the annual limit to each Midcoast community proportionate to its relative size or need. In other words, the permitted annual amount of growth, whether it be 125 units, whether it be 80 units, whether it be 52 units, or 38 units, which would be the topic of the session tonight, whatever you decide with this alternative, it would distribute, it would, that, that limit would be distributed among the Midcoast communities based on either relative community population, relative land area, or relative amount of future development, or some other community attribute that we could develop. For example, uh, some calculations that we had done about a year ago when we were preparing this report a year and a half ago, um, if one was to distribute the annual limit by population, vis-a-vis, -vis, if you're commission endorsed keeping 125 or lowering to 52, whatever, that ceiling, that cap would be distributed by according to the relative population of the constituent communities, meaning that 28% of that limit would be earmarked for Monterra, 18% Moss Beach, and 54% El Granada Miramar. Uh, we did not disaggregate the two at this point because we were just using sets of data which put it together. Now, the, if you wanted to uh, endorse the community distributed alternative but not do it by population but the relative land area, then it would be 26% Monterra, 22% Moss Beach, 42% uh, El Granada, and 10% Miramar. Actually, the number's very close there. Um, if you distributed the growth by the number of vacant parcels, uh, which is the third option shown on the screen, which again, if, uh, your commission endorsed a numeric limit of this is how many new units per year, this would be the percentages for each community. And the way this would, uh, I don't know why there's a nine here, but anyway, it would be 17% for Monterra, 31% for Moss Beach, 41% uh, for El Granada, and 11% for Miramar. At the final community workshop that was held on this task, 88% of the workshop uh, speakers endorsed the status quo alternative. That would retain the existing 125 units per year limit and also would retain the ability for the Board of Supervisors to raise the limit to 200. This group also proposed that second units at caretaker quarters be excluded from the limit. So when we were having the workshops, uh, there was a large turnout for those who endorsed the status quo. Uh, the remainder of those who spoke endorsed the other, other end of the spectrum. At that same workshop, approximately 11% of the workshop speakers endorsed the Half Moon Bay-based uh, alternative, which, as I've indicated earlier, would lower the limit to a 1% annual population growth, and it currently, as I indicated, would be lowering it to 38 uh, units per year. Uh, this group also endorsed distributing the growth among the mid coast communities, as I just explained. So if you, uh, in terms of what happened at the workshop, 89% um, 80, or 88% uh, endorsed the status quo and about 11, 12% endorsed the Happen Bay approach. Next, I'm gonna go over the endorsement of the Mid-Coast Community Council. Okay, the, uh, as, you, as you received at the first meeting on this project, a letter from Mid Coast Community Council. In that letter, it's your recommendation for task four. The council recommends applying Half Moon Bay's approved 1% growth <coughs> rate. That would be their measure D, uh, which I said currently works out to be approximately 38 units uh, per year. 
the Mid Coast Community Council also indicated in their letter that under no circumstances should the annual growth limit exceed the historical rate of 52 units per year. The uh, Mid Coast County endorses also the dis uh, community distributive uh, alternative, which will be distributing the number of new units uh, units amongst the Mid Coast communities including, according to their growth potential. Uh, growth potential which is the remaining undeveloped lot. So basically what the council is saying, uh, we endorse 38 units per year, under no circumstances should it be more than 52, and where the limit lies, 38, 52, distributed amongst the communities based on the remaining undeveloped lots. Also, the council reiterated that all residential units, including second units and caretake orders, should be included in this count, and that the growth limit um, is for uh, the, the growth limits for all new dwelling units, not building permits. This is a current um, fine tuning or house cleaning one we will have to do with the language to clarify the difference between building permits and dwelling units. And I can explain that for a bit. The staff recommendation has many of the same elements as the Mid Coast Council recommendation, uh, but worded a little differently. Uh, and some different policy recommendations as well. Um, what I'm going to do is summarize the main, what I'm going to do is discuss our recommendation and then summarize the main difference between the staff recommendation and the community, the Mid Coast Community Council's recommendation, and then I will close my presentation. So, what staff recommends is, <coughs> staff recommends that the annual residential growth rate limit be lowered from 100, 125 units per year to either 80 units per year, equivalent to a new third year build out term, or 52 units per year, equivalent to the average rate of development since 1981. Also, we're recommending the, uh, the distributing that limit amongst the communities, allocate and distribute the annual residential growth rate limit amongst the Mid Coast communities according to the relative number of vacant lots in each community, i.e. the growth potential. Third point is uh, apply the annual growth rate limit to all residential units except those on LCP designated affordable housing sites. And this means include single family units, multi-family units, second units, mixed units, mixed use units, and caretaker quarters. Also, clarify that the growth rate limit applies to number of residential units, not number of building permits. And then, uh, consider whether to delete the provision authorizing the Board of Supervisors to raise the annual growth rate to 200 units. Um, and then, if you, can, if you determine that you wish to retain that provision, then we would suggest that you substitute it with a ratio so that um, Let's say you're, if your counts, if your commission settled on 52 units a year, uh, our recommendation is if you would allow uh, to include that clause that allows the board to raise it, we would see it inappropriate to raise it all the way up to 200. Currently, we allow 125, and then there's provision to raise it to 200. That's a ratio of 1.6. So basically, should you decide to keep the provision to allow the board to raise it, make you insert the 1.6 as the multiplier. That would be our recommendation. Basically, our recommendation is to consider whether to delete it altogether or retain it. And if you do retain it, uh, go with the ratio rather than uh, an absolute number. Well, with that said, I'd like to now put on what I see as the only significant difference between the county, rec county staff recommendation and the Mid Coast Council recommendation. I mean, there's a we use, we use different language to say a lot of the same thing. Fundamentally, our, our, pro, our recommendations are different when it relates to the number of new units per year. And this is the, this, the projector on the screen summarizes that key difference. Basically, the staff recommendation is lower the growth rate limit to either 80 units per year or 52 units per year. The Mid Coast Council recommendation is lower the growth rate to 38 units per year, but never more than 52 units. So that's really the if you boil it down to an essence, the difference between the staff recommendation and the Mid Coast Council recommendation is what's on the screen. And that's also what's shown, um, I think, in the green, green uh, handout. So, uh, with that said, I would conclude my staff presentation.
Thank you very much, George. Are there any questions uh, the commissioners have for George Burton? And I'll, I will leave the projectors up there for people to use in the presentation. We have that, looks like. Yeah, we, we, it looks like we've got 24 speaker slips. If anybody hasn't, wants to speak and hasn't handed in a speaker slip, please do so uh, as soon as possible. It looks to me like we've got time to give speakers uh, up to five minutes each, but I'd like to ask people uh, if, if they do find themselves agreeing with what a prior speaker has said, it's uh, enough to merely note that and it's not necessary to plow the same ground again. And everyone, when you do speak, please, uh, if you, for the tape of the meeting, repeat your name and address for the record. That would be helpful. Uh, our first speaker, who will, because he represents the Mid Coast Community Council, receive 10 minutes is Paul Turkovic, to be followed by Chuck Kozak. If he's here. I'm uh, not going to use the 10 minutes. Uh, Good evening, uh, Commissioners. My name is Paul Perkovic. Uh, I live in Montara, and I am currently the chair of the Metro's Community Council. Chuck Kozak had been assigned to the presentation tonight, and he was um, uh, has been at Annual Nuevo today, and was out of the boat, and they had some problems getting back in, and he called to let me know that he's been very late. So I'm going to give you a very abbreviated uh, presentation, and he'll be here later. Um, Essentially, George has, has very, I think, uh, well summarized the recommendations that uh, the council have forwarded to the commission. Uh, I'd like to look a little bit at the background reasoning that we use in coming up with those. Uh, one of them is uh, several years ago, there was a joint project between the city of Hapkin Bay, the city of Pacifica, and the county of San Mateo which was partially funded by the Association of Bay Area Governments. It was a sub-regional planning project, and that identified that one of the major problems was a jobs housing imbalance on the, on the coast. On the uh, Bay side, there tend to be too many jobs and not enough housing. Out here, there tends to be too much housing and not enough jobs. I'd like to emphasize that the recommendations we're making in terms of uh, development growth rate controls apply only to residential living units uh, there has been no intention on the part of the council uh, at any time that I'm aware of to urge a limitation on development of industrial, commercial, visitor serving, and other uh, components in the community which would help uh, change the jobs housing balance more in favor of jobs uh, and also be appropriate for more visitor serving uh, uses. Secondly, the council has long been arguing on a capacity based planning on uh, Look at the resources available in the community and fit the population and other uses within those resources. And Chuck is particularly uh, good at speaking to that, so I'll leave that for him later. Um, and uh, third, we again would like to remind the commission that uh, the Mid-Coast is a resource not just for the people who live here or just for the county, uh, but for the Act, the whole state of California under the Coastal Act and really is a resource for visitors from all over the country and all over the world. And we'd like to uh, do what we can to preserve it so that it serves future generations. When you're looking at ca carrying capacity limits, you get into uh, the lifeboat analogy problem. If you have a lifeboat that says capacity 90 passengers and you have 75 people in the lifeboat and the more that are out there wanting to get in, the people that are in the lifeboat are usually fairly willing to welcome additional people up until where they see the capacity limit. And then they get nervous because they realize that maybe you can get one or two more than the rated capacity, but pretty soon you're going to put everybody at risk. Uh, and I, I think you can appreciate that there's some point at which the lifeboat sinks and everything's lost. Now, it's not quite the same here because we're not going to have a catastrophic failure of systems so that everybody's investment in the community is, is suddenly lost. But instead, you have a gradual deterioration in quality of life. And uh, 
we see that happening to people as their commute times are extended, uh, as the time it takes for their children to go to school becomes more problematic, uh, as they're asked to cut back on their use of water resources, and especially in drought situations when, when they're given mandatory cutbacks. Um, it's a tough job trying to decide what is the carrying capacity, and it's a tough job trying to keep people to live within it. Uh, but I hope you will do your best, and uh, I'll be eagerly listening to other speakers. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, I had called on Chuck Kozak, but of course he's not here here then yet. So I'll call on, I believe it's Timothy Pond to be followed by Carolyn Rogers. Good evening. My name is Tim Pond and I live at 611 Francisco in El Granada. I have a family and I commute every day over 92 at 7 o'clock in the morning. Um, I think the uh, current limit should be retained. Um, first of all, I think there's about maybe 50 people in the lifeboat here that complain about the same issue over and over again. And most people here have no problem with developing the infill properties that are here. It represents, it, it gave us and my family a chance to build a home and live in a nice house in an area where we never would have been able to because we were able to buy the lot, which is not in a subdivision, and build on it and move into it. Um, I think that, anyway, it's a great town for kids, and it's a great town to live in. And I do not think that the traffic situation here is any worse than any place else in the Bay Area. Um, I've lived in other towns. I've made commutes to Palo Alto. I've made commutes, you know, all over the place. I could get up here and say, we got our house here. I don't think anybody should be able to live near us. We have vacant lots on both sides of this. And, um, you know, a lot of people come here, they live here for a few years, and then they decide no growth is the way to go. And the way they attain it, in my opinion, is through an obfuscation of the improvement process to the infrastructure, through degrading the schools, through de and looking to block any improvement in the infrastructure, and therefore, and then point to this lack of infrastructure as a justification for no growth. Um, in Half Moon Bay, I know Dennis Coleman has defended his process for getting Highway 92 through. It took a very long time, went through a lot of revisions. We all suffered up here because of, uh, you know, the length of time that, you know, process took. It's finally been approved by you, or by the uh, county to get funding. But anyway, I'd just like to say that uh, I don't really think there's a need to lower the limit. I don't see a boom town. Uh, atmosphere here. I see a community where people can um, buy an individual. I don't see a lot of big developers operating in here. I don't see an environmental impact where you would see if you had growth going on in an undeveloped subdivision, like they have in some areas in Half Moon Bay. Infill lots need to be developed. They're a proper place to put housing now without going into green space and open space. I think it's fine to build the lots around me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carolyn Rogers to be followed by uh, Dorothy uh, Bachman. Sorry, for, I should po apologize in, in advance to anyone's name I haven't mangled yet. I'll get around to you later. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, my name is Carolyn Rogers. I live in El Granada, and I'm speaking this evening for the first time as the vice chair of Princeton Citizens Advisory Committee. Um, good evening, and thank you once again for bringing these meetings to the coast side. As Mr. Bergman noted, um, the great majority of the Princeton community, as well as the community in attendance at the public workshop on this task, favor the status quo alternative. Additionally, we do not believe that mixed use and caretaker residential units should be included in the build out total. Currently, these units comprise about 2% of the total housing stock. By my rough calculations from the numbers in our original work book on this, um, we do an update. Potential such units to be developed yet is only about 1.5% of uh, future build-out. 
as a very small number. Moreover, the mixed use and caretaker units are not a given use on the property. They're an option. You can't, a property is not necessarily going to develop mixed use. It, it's as likely or it's possible that it goes to commercial. Also, um, the property owner you know, will not necessarily put a caretaker unit on a property even if the permit's available. Um, add to the, that the fact that in the waterfront area, the availability of permits for caretaker units is contingent on a percentage of development overall. This establishes a control for that area in itself. Currently, uh, you can only have one caretaker unit for each 20% of properties developed. Um, we know that in you know, discussing how to distribute the annual bill of that around, whatever it may be, all the recommendation is to include mixed use and caretaker units in the total build out numbers. No mention, of, no mention is made of wanting any of that build out to Princeton. If it is determined to include these units in the annual growth limit, you know, certainly allowance for these units and an administrative mechanism for allotting some to Princeton needs to be put in place. The desire on the part of the Princeton community to allow for some residential development goes beyond just providing housing. These units afford a measure of security and safety to neighboring businesses as well as other residents in the area. If you know patterns of theft and dumping in Princeton, it's always on the west, you know, least traffic streets and in the less inhabited areas. I was interested in Mr. McCarthy's correspondence, um, citing section 14.24, uh, providing infrastructure to support housing development. When I read that provision and a few others relating to water and sewer capacity in the LCP, I heard it as a directive that the utility has shown you that it's their job description, you know, that you know, here's still that and you need to provide um, capacity for that. Um, in that regard, yes, I mean, we're in a, you know, we are in a somewhat fragile situation, and I believe that that kind of points to a failure to, you know, do those jobs. Um, if anything, it seems that the various boards have done everything to hamper development by restricting availability of resources. It's my hope that with a revised annual growth rate and enforcement of all LCP policies, including the directives to provide capacity, you know, that we can go forward to a community with resources that are adequate to the health and safety needs of all of them here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dorothy Bobbin, followed by Barbara Lohman. I live in El Granada, and I've attended a couple of the meetings, but not the last workshop. My experience has been that most of the people that are in favor of the most growth are always the contractors. Um, I think that we should be centering our thing on the person's personal private lives. I don't think that build out should be on someone's uh, income. This is where you're living. This is not basically where you're making your income. As you should be where you're living. This is your quality of life, not your income. Uh, coming in from Half Moon Bay, it took me six lights tonight to come from Kelly to Highway 92 to get through that light because there's no, tra there's, there's no way to get from just one block on Highway 1 at 5 o'clock. It takes six lights to get through the one light. Uh, that's too many cars going north. Uh, we shouldn't have as many cars going north right now or increasing it at all. In the morning, it's the same thing going south because there's too many cars on Highway 1 trying to get over to San Mateo. Uh, I support everything so far that the Mid Coast Community Council has proposed. I, especially the regional planning alternative, I think that if we have been going with 52 units historically, Right now you can see, if you drive down Highway 1, there are just nothing but buildings going on. Buildings going in in Miramar and El Granada. Uh, it's just too much too soon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Barbara Lohman, followed by Kevin Lance. Good evening. My name is Barbara Lohman, Miramar. 
It's one thing to consider the negative impact of growth on the community, and quite another to consider the advantages of slowing growth on both our community and its visitors, visitor serving function. We are a recreational resource for many other communities on, um, in San Mateo County. The present growth rate, if it continues, cannot help but negatively impact that visitor serving function. Paul Perkovic made a biological um, analogy, and I would like to continue that. In biological systems, populations often exceed their carrying capacity, and they solve that problem with a population crash. If we exceed our carrying capacity in this community by overdevelopment, the ecosystem will be close to impossible to recover, and we will not be able to replace what we have destroyed. To avoid this problem, the coastline needs to be treated as a community. We share infrastructure, we share recreation, we share a school district, we share traffic, we share the environment with Half Moon Bay. Half Moon Bay currently has a 1% growth limit passed by the voters. The rest of the county is experiencing a 1% growth rate. That rate is also appro appropriate for this part of the county. I would ask that you support the community and the Coast Community Council's recommendation of 1%. Let us have some chance of retaining our unique character. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kevin Lansing, followed by Jack McCarthy. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kevin Lansing. I'm a resident of Hackney Bay. I'm a member of the city's architectural review committee, although tonight I'm speaking as an individual. Although I am not a resident of the Mid Coast, I think we all can agree that all coastside residents are affected by the residential growth limits, whether they are within the cities of Capital Bay's uh, limits or on the mid coast. I would strongly urge the Planning Commission to reduce the residential growth limits to 1%, consistent with the rate that was overwhelmingly approved by Half Moon Bay voters who passed Measure D in 1999. As you know, the average residential growth rate on the mid coast since 1981 has been 52 units per year. And this is also approximately the average growth rate that has occurred over the last two years on the mid coast. In 2001, we saw 53 units. In 2002, 54 units. Yet despite this 50 unit plus growth rate, and despite the rather subdued character of the Bay Area economy over the last two years, we have observed dramatically worsening congestion on Highway 1, particularly traveling south during the morning commute. Given the existing level of congestion that we already have in place, and given the fact that the Bay Area economy seems poised to accelerate over the next several years, one can reliably forecast it that the historical average growth rate of 52 units per year will place an excessive burden on mid-coast infrastructure. A hallmark of good planning is to incorporate a margin of safety into the analysis. I would urge the Planning Commission to build in a margin of safety in future planning as it relates to the capacity of mid coast infrastructure. Reducing the residential growth rate to 1% per year would provide that margin of safety. Given the overwhelming voter support of 1% growth in half a day, one could reliably expect that the overwhelming majority of mid coast voters would also support such a limit if they were given the opportunity to vote on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jack McCarthy followed by uh, Jimmy Benton. Good evening, I'm Jack McCarthy of uh, Half Moon Bay. <clears throat> I'm a member of the Half Moon Bay Planning Commission, but I'm speaking as an individual tonight. I uh, submitted a letter, and I'll just quickly uh, summarize it. Uh, we really thank you for coming over here tonight and spending your time. I know it's gonna wind up being late for you. Um, I also support 1% uh, uh, growth limit. Uh, I feel that um, the city of uh, Half Moon Bay, the residents of Half Moon Bay, voted for Measure D uh, to restrict uh, growth of, to 1% there. And the elected representatives of the Mid Coast, uh, the Mid Coast Community Council, also support a 1% growth limit. I think it's clear that they recognize the level of traffic uh, and infrastructure in this region is E or F and is projected to get worse in the next 10 years. With that, with that in mind, uh, th there seems to be no alternative but uh, a 1% growth rate as the people have voted. Uh, in addition, um, you're going to be pursuing an ambitious and right-minded affordable housing policy that will also have an impact uh, on the uh, quality of life, the traffic, and the infrastructure, however good it is. Um, and also, I'd like to um, say that I think that the provision 
uh, allowing supervisors to um, intercede and raise the limit uh, on certain conditions. I think that should be deleted because we don't know what would happen in some future date with the supervisors. I just think that uh, the LCP should uh, be the governing principle. But thank you very much again. Thank you. Uh, Jimmy Benjamin, followed by Julia Kulda. Uh, seeing that appears uh, Mr. Benjamin isn't here, I'll put this slip aside and call it again later. He's arrived. Julia Kulda, followed by Gail Erickson. Juliet Kulda. I live at 506 Carmel Avenue here in El Granada. A year ago, I was present at both of the workshop meetings regarding this topic and was amazed at the turnout from the community of those that are against this growth restriction. This room was pretty packed full, and I believe it came out, George could correct me here, but it's something like 97 against this growth restriction and maybe 17 for it. So I don't want that to go unnoticed that um, in those two previous workshops, there were many, many people here against this. And tonight, they probably don't know about it or they think it's been forgotten, it's been a year, and we thought it was a victory that wasn't gonna be restricted. So I just wanna point out there is that large number of people against it. And I'm not sure why, I never understood why this restriction's even coming up because um, we're not even at half of the current approval of the 125. We're not even building up half those numbers in the community. So I'm, kind of surprised that they're trying to limit it. So from 125 down to 30 or whatever, um, doesn't make sense to me. But uh, I want to point out that uh, a lot of the land here on the coast is state property or open space or agricultural land. And of the land that is left for residential, um, that is owned residential, it seems as if it should be, we should be allowed to build houses, people should be able to build houses on those those lots, and there's already so many restrictions imposed. Um, we don't want any more restrictions on top of the restrictions we already have to build on those lots that are already there for building. Uh, and then I want to make a comment regarding the traffic, because I'm hearing a lot about how we have a traffic problem in Half Moon Bay. I go back and forth constantly from Elgin out of Half Moon Bay, and I'm the first to admit we have a traffic problem. <laughs> and I'm not sure why people think that if we restrict the growth from 50 down to 30, or even 100 down to 30, that it's gonna make the traffic go away. It's not gonna make the traffic go away. That's a separate issue that I think should be handled somehow, somewhere, in some meeting that, you know, maybe we should make a bigger highway one. So we all are aware of that, and I don't think this is gonna solve it if we restrict the building by 20 houses over the next so many years. Um, and in conclusion, on behalf of the 88% of the voters that have been showing up at the workshops um, that are against this, this growth, I just want to say I would be very surprised and disappointed if those 88% um, are not heard and if this, um, if this limit, if the status quo changes to a, a lesser amount, um, I think we would be very surprised about that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gail Aronson, followed by Ann Carey. Thank you very much. My name is Gail Aronson. I live in El Granada. And I want to begin by saying something that's very strange to me and I don't understand. All this 82% of the people were here in support of keeping things as they exist from El Granada. I've been talking to many residents that I know that are very concerned about the building that's been going on here right now. And they never heard of, they don't know about these meetings. That's why they don't come. If they knew about them, they'd be here. So I'm a little bit concerned. I did not, I was not aware of the fact that this was a vote that when people come here and they speak, it's vote number one, vote number two, that we're counting votes. If that's the case, and I think we need to inform other residents right now, they all better get here and put past their vote. I don't like hearing, and I think that's a mistake, but I really hope everyone's not thinking that when I get up here, I'm casting a vote for this new restrictions. I'm not casting a vote. I'm speaking my opinion about this. And other people that are telling you they want to keep it the same, they're speaking their opinion, they're not casting a vote. So I'm up here speaking my opinion on this. I'd like to say I'd like to keep this at 1%, the growth rate 1%, never to exceed, exceed the historical 52 units. And also, this should also include all second units. That's very really important, so if somebody wants to build a mother-in-law type apartment, that's also important. 
And I think also the really important thing has to do with quality of life. When I mentioned before that I have neighbors and people who have been contacting me, some people are really concerned about the building that's now going on. A lot of things being built in El Granada right now, and there are very large homes being built on very small lots. And again, people that I've spoken to in El Granada are very concerned about that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and Harry, followed by Eagle Vargas. Good evening. I'm Ann Carey, and I have been a participant and have experienced a growth, uh, excuse me, and have experienced numerous years in the half and day growth rate allocation program. And I would like to speak from that perspective. In regards to the half and day alternative of a 1% growth rate, it's imperative that you're informed of the tremendous cost, complexities, and difficulties of implementing a growth rate when demand exceeds supply. I've attended an incredible number of public hearings in regards to creating the governing document and process for implementing the 1% growth rate and for the annual allocation distribution competitions. There have already been as many public hearings regarding the implementation ordinance for the 1% growth rate as you will have regarding the entire LCP update. Large sums have been allocated to legal expenses for lawsuits regarding the interpretation of its current implementation ordinance. The allocation system not only impacts the lot owners, the builders, and developers, but also the counties. It's important that county selects an annual growth rate that it can implement and that the growth rate and policies are flexible so that the county can meet its own planning objectives. Half Moon Bay's 1% ordinance passed in 1999, but Half Moon Bay has not yet adopted an implementation ordinance that must also be certified by the Coastal Commission. Therefore, the city is still operating under the 3% ordinance. The city's difficulty in adopting an ordinance centers on how the city can meet its own planning objectives while meeting the 1% growth rate. Due to the city's prior approval of approximately 300 units in best tentative maps and a development agreement for an additional 225 units, which provided community benefits, the city has had to struggle with whether it will exempt those hundreds of units from the 1% growth rate, or to try to determine a policy that will allow the city to meet its obligations under the development agreement, its litigation settlements and court orders, and still allow some kind of permit to be available for the small builder while remaining within the 1% limit. Flexibility has proved to be important for Half Moon Bay because the city has not implemented the 1% growth rate. The city has the flexibility to determine a growth rate between 1% and 3% each year. I object to allocating and distributing the growth rate among the Midcoast communities. This will only further the complexity and difficulty of implementing and managing the allocation system. Rather than focusing on the distribution of allocations among communities, the focus should be placed on examining the policies of the water and sewer districts to determine how the policies and projects are affecting growth in the various communities and how the policies and the projects can be modified to provide more equal growth rates among communities. Distributing growth to the community will drive demand to Moss Beach and Montero, where current concerns have been expressed about the drilling of wells. I think that the idea that the Board of Supervisors raise the growth rate when sufficient infrastructure capacity exists is backwards. I believe that the growth rate should be where supply exceeds demand and where it's consistent with the build-out rate of the county. The county as a whole will be reaching general plan build out within the next 10 to 20 years. So the status quo alternative is a 20 year build out. When the Board of Supervisors finds that the improvements to infrastructure capacity have been made, thereby driving growth, then a growth limit should be enacted. I'm not convinced that the county will be able to manage its growth more effectively through spending a fixed amount of time and financial resources on implementing and managing a growth rate which is smaller than demand. Rather than continuing to dedicate its time and financial resources to planning objectives, objectives 
such as the LCP update and the acquisition and donation of land such as Murata Surf, McNeese State Ranch, and Rancho Cortier. Thank you. Thank you. April Vargas is followed by uh, Ray uh, Eckert. Good evening, Commissioner. Thank you for coming over. Uh, my name is April Vargas. I live in Montana, and I'm speaking tonight on behalf of the for Green Foothill. Um, at your, your meeting on October 22nd concerning Task 4, uh, your commission voted unanimously to accept data submitted with regard to infrastructure capacity. Citizens and representatives from local special districts emphasize the inability of existing resources to provide sufficient capacity to serve build out. The faster that build out is approached, the sooner and more severely the community will experience these infrastructure deficiencies. In an attempt to allow capacities to keep pace, even with the current demand, the Committee for Green Foothill strongly recommends setting the build-out rate at the historic 52 units per year throughout the mid-coast. Should the Commission decide to adopt the more restrictive 1% growth rate, the Committee would have no objection, however. We urge the Commission to establish the growth rate limit applied to the number of residential units and not the number of building permits. We urge that the maximum number of units under the growth rate limit would never exceed 52 units per year. Uh, significantly increasing this number would have impacts on the planning department operations as well as the local coastal resources. County planners, from our experience, are already working at or over capacity with the current 52 units average per year. Uh, with frozen positions, uh, it's questionable that it would be practically possible to be processing any more than the current rate of 52 per year. Um, finally, uh, in the staff report, there are legal parameters outlined for growth rates to be established to take into account small town character, open space, population density, and orderly growth. These are the same types of concerns that also would apply to the new code. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ray Heckert, followed by Karen Wilson. Hi, my name is Ray Heckert, 1132 Plummer Street, Elgin. Uh, I support the uh, current growth rate limits the way they are. Um, uh, three years ago, I bought a piece of property and was able to fulfill a lifelong dream of building my own house, and I think uh, anybody that wants to do so should be able to. I think to do otherwise, I think is un-American. And uh, I think what we need to do is increase infrastructure, not um, put restrictions, uh, restrictions on developing and fill lots. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Karen Wilson, followed by Lorraine Beth. Hi, my name is Karen Wilson. Um, clearly, this is not an issue of no growth. This is an issue of good planning, protecting our natural resources, protecting our infrastructure, so that everyone here is their health and safety are, are looked after. Um, not only that, our property values. As we gridlock our streets, we have limited water resources, we have no access to schools, we lower our property value for those that already live here. Um, currently, we don't have any, we, we won't have a middle school on the mid coast or a high school, and the current district has no plans of, of locating one up here. That's just another impact that will affect um, development. Um, yeah, Highway 1's bad. If you're coming from Montana, it's worse than anything. From El Granada is a breeze if you're trying to get there from Montana. And so the impacts just get worse. Um, the, briefly, you know, just we've all, everybody, like, supported what everyone said on the 1%, but I just briefly want to talk about um, being a single parent on the coast. If you're trying to raise children here, and be the full-time full single supporter of those children, and you have to spend 15, 20 minutes, a half hour, an hour additional each way in your car, that's time you can't be home to care for your children. It, it, there's also another burden there um, of daycare and, and time to not be a parent. Um, and in a society that we have today, that's, um, there's, a, there's a large group of them out there who, who can't attend these meetings or follow these issues with the concerns that they might have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lorraine Heather, followed by Catherine Slater-Carter. Hi, my name is Lorraine Feather, and I live in Okanada. 
And I don't want to cover the same ground as everyone else. I support the 1% growth rate as well. I do think that it bears saying that among the 88% that came out um, to the community workshop in favor of keeping the limits the way they are, probably 98% of the 88% are realtors, developers, or people who stand to make money on, on crowding the coast. I don't blame them for coming out, but the Mid-Coast Community Council really speaks for the people in El Granada that did not know this meeting was existing, did not know to come, because they didn't realize that it had something to do with them. And it really, really does. It has a lot to do with anybody that has to go over 92, which cannot be widened to the size of the San Diego freeway. It's just not even legal or possible. Um, it has to be slowed down, or it's just not going to be pleasant here at all. Traffic is terrible. My husband has to go over the hill. He doesn't know it's seven, as the other fellow said. He tries to go later and come home later, but those times when he's had to go between eight and nine, it's just awful. It's horrible, and the idea of it being twice as bad by doubling the population is just unthinkable. So we're hoping that you'll help us out. That's it. Thank you. Catherine Slater Carter, followed by uh, Ian McCurry. Good evening, Catherine Slater Carter. I'm president of the Montero Water Sanitary District. I'm here speaking as an individual, but I'm going to base my comments on my long experience in that district. I'm also a member of the Mid Coast Community Council, and I support the Mid Coast Community Council recommendation of 1% because of the infrastructure problems that we have here. A previous speaker did not understand, understand why there is any kind of growth rate or building rate here. It's because of the need for infrastructure planning. That's a key concept. It has to do with whose money is spent, when, and for what rate of time. Right, I spent the afternoon in a mid-coast community, or in a uh, Coastside County Water District meeting listening to engineers talk about the El Granada transmission pipeline and the build out, they weren't talking about rates, they were talking about a pipeline that's going to last for 50 years. Uh, we need to know what size pipeline we need for what length of time. We can't just, because pipelines actually have lifespans as do pumps and sewer plants. Also, water and sewer districts, to speak to another comment by another speaker, do not control growth. Under state law, we are there simply to make our plans based on what our current needs are and what our anticipated needs are and to plan and, and provide structure accordingly. Unfortunately, in California right now, and I believe for the next 20 years or so, water is going to be a key concern. I think it's important to remember that the decision that we make tonight is, a, is limited in amount of time. The last one was made about 23 years ago for this growth rate. Now we're looking at current circumstances and evaluating what the growth rate for the next 20 or so years should be. Again, I support the 1% for the next 20 years and 20 more years that other group of folks can discuss and look at the plans and maybe they'll come up with 20%, who knows. Um, we have over 700 wells on individual, or homes on individual wells right now. Under the Coastside County Water District area, 350 of those are in El Granada, CCWD has said in public meetings that those are not in their uh, sole and unconnected water permits. We've got to be able to have some time and some, some planning to take care of those under the water and sanitary district is, is looking for water and, and, and ways to get it to us. Again, if our building rate is too high, it's going to put a huge pressure and probably lead to some very bad planning decisions. Um, item three uh, it has to do with the affordable housing component, and I'm concerned that this will that there is not any coordination between the general plan amendment that you gentlemen heard today and, and what is being proposed here. And I think that needs to be looked at very closely. We all use the same infrastructure. We need to make sure that the uh, affordable housing is planned for in our program. As far as setting an upper limit, I agree with the previous speakers. I think that needs to be watched very closely. And if it is set, please put some strong um, conditions on it, rather than just 
the, the current conditions, as I recall, are that if you, if we get up near 200, near over 125, Board of Supervisors can simply pop it up saying we need to exceed it. I believe we need to look much more closely at the infrastructure before that number is exceeded. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Julian McCrick, followed by Leonard Warren. Uh, hello, I'm Julian McCurry. I'm chair of the Princeton Citizens Advisory Committee. Uh, we've been working on the LCP review and update as our project for development in Princeton since March of 1999. Uh, I'd like to say that I support the position of PCAC as put forth by Carolyn Rogers and Jeff. Um, I also, after uh, listening to the comments of Ann Terry, we're very supportive of her comments, so it's successful and well founded. Uh, one thing I'm hearing here a lot that I don't quite understand is staff recommendation here. Um, we've had a professional staff that's been working on this process for a very long time. It's been an enormous amount of effort on it. And candidly, I think it should carry a little more weight than it does. So one thing that really kind of I don't it doesn't fit for me here as an individual is deleting the supervisor's ability to respond to the needs of the community. And that seems inherently wrong to me. Um, I think the supervisors, of course, are being put in that position because they have the best interest of the, uh, of the constituents at heart. And of course, not to have a stopgap measure for being able to fix wrongs that we thought were right at one point seems stupid at that point. Um, uh, also, uh, resources are not fixed. Capacity can be developed in different regards. Um, there's wells in Montana that were put in for a golf course that have never been, uh, that have never been utilized. And there are a lot of wells in the area. Some of those produce a tremendous amount of water, and they're, they're, they're public, they're on private properties. Those, that's resource. That's how it's achieved and gotten. That's up to gentlemen such as yourselves. You um, as for, uh, principally, that's the end of my remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Leonard Warren, followed by Dan Blake. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, um, uh, certainly, I agree with uh, all of the people seeking for the communities that are uh, urging you to go for a lower growth rate. I think the, the one percent is appropriate. Uh, I have uh, uh, all. Uh, let me just point out right now that I have 
pretty conclusive evidence here. The numbers in the staff report are incorrect and they're 20% higher than reality. Um, On the uh, intersection level of service, I commented uh, at uh, a recent uh, previous planning commission hearing that it's not just the roadway segments that are the issue. Intersections are in fact worse, and, and all of the intersections in Captain Bay, I think, are LOSF during commute time. So the fact that some of the roadway segments are on an LOSF is misleading because you have to look at the intersections, and when it takes you three, four, five cycles to get through the intersection, um, you know that, that you have a problem. Um, on schools, uh, there's a comment here that says that the Rio Unified School District's exact school impact the new residential development to offset the costs. What it doesn't say is that it offsets about a third of the costs, and that means that the existing residents have to pay two-thirds of the costs to build the schools for the new development. There's just no way that that's fair. That's a problem with state law, but, uh, and regardless of whether it's reasonable, the problem is that's the way it is. That's what we're stuck with. Um, I definitely support the distributing growth by the number of vacant parcels, but I would like to suggest uh, a little tweak to that. Make it the number of conforming parcels so that the non-conforming parcels aren't even counted at all when you're determining how many you can allocate to each community. Um, so down with the Mid-Coast Council recommendation, I support the 1% growth limit. I uh, support, well, basically, I don't think it should ever be allowed to exceed 1%, so the second bullet is, is not uh, significant to me. I uh, support the distribution, I uh, count everything, uh, and clarify that it's new dwelling units, now, some, some speakers have said, why lower the growth limit? It's to allow the infrastructure that's difficult to fund, which is notably roads, to catch up. And, and the faster, the, the higher the growth rate, the harder it is to get the funding quickly enough to improve the roads. So it just can't happen. The, the, the roads are on a much, much longer time frame to, to catch up. And, and various other infrastructure has similar problems, but at different rates, like schools are also on take longer to catch up. Uh, and one, one side effect, I think you've heard this before, I can't remember. The, uh, the, the higher the, the, the uh, level of construction, the more trucks there are on the road. And, and each truck takes as much road capacity as quite a number of cars. So that really compounds the congestion uh, very significantly. And regarding Ken Perry's comments, uh, regarding the difficulties with implementing Geyser D and Captain Bay, just because the right thing, to do, uh, just because doing something good is difficult to implement doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Now, the last thing I'm going to cover, this is a listing of every permit that we're not a sanitary district issued in the same period as the table that's on page two here. And that table adds up to 310. This is a listing of 164 units. I happen to know that one of the permits was canceled and expired and we didn't ever allow the, the building. The building permit didn't happen either. I, I was unable to get the same detail listing from Montero Sanitary in time, but one of the directors who is not here tonight told me it was 88 units since new capacity came online and obviously none before that. So if I add those up, I get 252 compared to staff's 310. That's a 20% discrepancy. So now if we take the, the the average of 52 over those five years, well, I don't know where I'm looking to do this, but it's, it's around 50 some odd a year. If we adjust it for that 20% discrepancy, now we're at 42, which is getting a lot closer to 1% of what a lot of people are talking about. So basically I can prove that the recent historic rate is lower than what's shown Report, and many people in the community feel that what we've had over the last few years is just at the limit of what's tolerable now and it really needs to be taken down to provide some relief. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Dan Blake, followed by Sarah Bass. Oh, thank
fact, I see a note, I'm sorry. Had to, there's a note here saying he had to leave. Uh, he said, under his comment, that he supports the 52 per uh, unit per year limit. Um, so Sarah Bansler followed by uh, Jay Marsh. Hi, thank you for being here. I'm Sarah Bassler. I live in Montana. Um, I'm supporting the Mid Coast Community Council recommendation. Um, and um, one thing I just want to mention is, you know, the Coastal Act purpose is so that the coast can be um, enjoyed by the public, and they can't really enjoy it too well if they can't get here. So I think the um, under contract condition. So we need to, as mentioned just previously, slow down the growth rate so the infrastructure can catch up. Also, the issue of water in the staff report, they actually talk about the county currently sponsoring a mid-coast groundwater study. And part of that is to determine the level of additional development, which could be supported on wells. So again, a reason to slow down the growth rate would be so we can find out what our water supply can support. And third, on the issue of people talking about the turnout of people at um, the workshops against um, slowing down the growth rate, I was recently um, elected to the Mid Coast Community Council, and I ran on the platform of slow growth and preserving the small town character of the community, and I got um, somewhat slightly over 800 votes. So I just wanted to mention that in terms of what does the community support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jay Marsh, followed by Carrie Burke. Good evening. My name is Jim Marsh. Uh, thank you very much for coming out. Um, I was, uh, I currently live in Half Moon Bay. I moved there about five years ago. I lived uh, here in town. Um, and I lived here in Okinawa for uh, something like 15, 16 years, raised kids, all that stuff. Uh, I strongly uh, urge you to accept the recommendations from the Mid Coast Community Council. Um, you know, they are elected people out there, and they do, uh, uh, I think, strongly consider and, and make recommendations. They certainly have spent a tremendous amount of time working with us and Mr. Bergman and their staff. Um, I, I would say just in sort of general general term, general topics for you to think about, just think about smart growth and trying to do planning in the sense of uh, conservation. Uh, do smart growth, put the people where existing infrastructure transit, uh, you know, where your densities need to be. Um, from the, the, the very beginning, I, I just urge you to be as conservative as you can. Uh, I now have six grandchildren, and they're, you know, various ages, but uh, they're going to inherit what my generation, when I was boomer, some left behind, and I think it's important that to the extent that we can, we leave them some decisions to make, whether the decision is about a natural resource, or traffic congestion, or just saying no. And I, I think we have to do something for them. And I think that trickles all the way down to the idea that uh, we as a society need to move away from the, the money over all this kind of uh, philosophy that we, we seem to have. Um, you know, if you, if you know the history of the, of the uh, Mid Coast out here, you'll understand that land is very speculative in the 1900s. In the early 1900s, and this earthquake happened, and the real estate market went in the handbasket out here. And if you look behind you, the niche for treasure, and you're seeing dollar signs again. I mean, it's pandemic, and I think we need to make some changes in the way we live our lives with the things we do. And so it can, you know, be as simple as starting like here with us now. So I urge you to uh, be conservative and to um, look up and adopt the recommendations from the council. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carrie Burke, followed by Grant Pollock. Carrie Burke still here. Uh, it says support eighty limit and retain board of supervisors option to increase limit. No allocation for. That's Maybe that's Princeton by the C community, but it's not quite clear to me what that writing is. So. Um, Fran Pollard, followed by Howard Lieberman. Good evening, Planning Commissioners. Um, Fran Pollard from El Granada. And uh, I, I also want to 
support the um, Mid Coast Community Council's recommendations of 1%, which I think was 38 units, but no more than 52 units. And, and the reason is I think that we deserve some quality of life, though it's disappearing fast, and not a quantity forced upon us as fast as we can. Um, I, I'm going to go through each page I've made some remarks on here. It, this is home for 30-year build-out, and I think the Coastal Commission has said we're only supposed to plan for 20 years, so that should bring down the numbers. Um, I absolutely say yes, you have to delete the 200 units um, that, that you could, or the board could possibly enforce on us. Um, I noticed that most of the numbers are calculated on 1999 numbers, uh, the, the, how many units exist and everything. Uh, and the traffic, I believe, was well, 2001. Well, since then, there have been, I'd say almost, it feels like double the, the population and the houses doubled in those last five years. So these numbers are way off and the population is already much heavier than what shows in here. And that needs, we've said this time and again, it, we need to come to the truth on these numbers. Um, I'll skip these things. The, all, all of this is, is dependent, again, as others said, on water, sewer, the fire, and everything else in it really impacts these the larger numbers and the faster growth rate, rates impact what we can what our resources here um, supply and, and we can't take those kind of numbers. Um, where traffic is concerned, as most people have already said, we're all I think it claims that we're only at E. I think we're at the F level already. We're at a standstill most of the time during the new traffic in the middle of the afternoon and we've all experienced waiting at one signal for five changes before you can get through it. So I would say that's F level already. Um, oh, okay, um, in the, on page seven where it has the little chart here of the existing numbers of units and then the building, this is the summary we were sent um, for just this meeting. And the build out numbers, and I noticed what I saw in another uh, area that the three R3A is missing from this. And I found out this morning, I sent you a, a last minute notice, I hope you got it this morning, I, I was told you did, that Oh, when you met on the um, affordable housing, and I doubt anyone or most people here don't even know that you had that meeting this afternoon. And I'd like to know why those numbers and that report was left out of this meeting tonight. Um, for those who don't know, it said somewhere in there that they're planning another 325 units in the front of El Vermont. In, in our little, you know, that R3, that's what the R3A zone is. And I'd like to know where in the world you're going to put 325 units in the front of El Bernard that's already overbuilt and congested and cars are parked in the street because there's no off-street parking for any of them now, or most of them. Because everybody has two or three cars. It's not like one unit, one car. Um, so I'd like to know why that wasn't part of this meeting or when we're going to be able to hear it. I understand that I think you approved it today and sent it on to the Board of Supervisors. And if that's true, then I would like to ask that you rescind that vote where it concerns the coast side until everyone here and every agency on this coast side has a chance to review it and comment on it. That's only fair. I think that's totally unfair to leave that, that element out of this whole project. Um, well, I think the rest of it has already been said. Um, 
determine what the needs of dating. You know, the numbers need updating. And um, others have said too that uh, the, the reason the meetings were lopsided or the, the support for the 125 up to 200 units per year uh, really was. I, I came to the first couple of workshops and then I and a lot of other people decided not to come anymore because it was just so lopsided where uh, a lot of the builders from outside the area were here with families, with workers, with contractors and their employees and you could see and they shouted people down and it was very uncontrolled and everyone was given a vote instead of the community. The people and most of the people that attended were community leaders, elected officials. So, you know, we said, well, shouldn't we count for a few more votes? Like uh, Sarah Baffler just said, she got 800 votes because for the low growth. But no, no, you get, you're here, you get one vote, and so does everybody else on the other side. And that was totally unfair. So um, I would like, to, I don't know if you're aware of that, but I would like to make that known. Thank you. Thank you. Just a comment very briefly on your last point. Certainly, the workshops are only fit. That's input that cranks in. It isn't. We don't take input either at those hearings or at those workshops as votes per se. And I think we we certainly try to make policy decisions based on the best evidence. And we aren't just simply going by applause meter with or without people from inside or outside the area. Commenting. So I, I, we know to take all of that with a grain of salt, as well as things we hear here. I mean, yeah. the things we hear throughout any hearings, we, we take a little grain of salt, but also a lot of seriousness because the input and certainly the thoughtfulness of comments made to us on any side of any of the issues before us is very important. Um, before we, we have two more speaker slips, but I thought it would be Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you because I didn't know if you were aware of the situations at those meetings. Well, no, the, the specifics you brought up were different uh, characterization I hadn't heard, but still, even with, without, I mean, we don't just simply say, oh, wow, 88% tonight is another percent. We're, we're, our job isn't simply to add up percentages and then try to get what we're about. And, and I feel like a community plan ought to be planned by the community, not by outsiders. Um, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, Fran Pollard brought, uh, asked some questions about the uh, county housing element of the action we took this afternoon. I thought it might be appropriate to ask for staff comments at this this time. Yes, um, the Planning Commission this afternoon did hold a second and final hearing on its recommendations to the Board of Supervisors with regard to the adoption of a revised housing element of the general plan. For those who aren't familiar with that, the housing element is basically the document that contains the county's housing policies, uh, how the county is going to um, achieve its own goals with regard to housing, particularly affordable housing, as well as goals that are to some degree set by the state and regional governments. Um, there's a uh, basically a statutory requirement that that element be updated periodically about every five years, and our prior element uh, has expired, so to speak, and we're working on adopting a new one. The housing element uh, requires certification by the state uh, of California through its Office of Housing and Community Development. It's the only general plan element that requires that. And so we're largely working against a set of state guidelines and the necessity to have the end result approved by the state. So that's kind of the background of where we're at. One of the uh, challenges in the housing element is to show that the community, in our case the unincorporated area of San Mateo County in its entirety, um, has uh, housing opportunities, the opportunities for development of additional housing that correlate with the, with the housing goals that we're responsible for. So um, we need to show the ability, at least in theory, to reach those um, those uh, goals. So part of the analysis that we go through is to look at the existing policy uh, and what it would accommodate or what it would provide in the, in the way of new housing development. And the primary way we do that is to look at existing land use policy zoning uh, provisions in all the unincorporated areas. 
and see where, ex where existing policy provides for additional housing development. We do our best to calculate what that would be, add it up, and see if it correlates with these overall targets. The number of 325 that uh, Fran Pollard was referring to is a part of that analysis. And what that relates to is um, we took a look. There is some multiple family residential zoning in El Granada, R3 zoning um, that allows basically apartments and condominiums, that type of thing. And we looked at that area of El Granada. Uh, what is the theoretical number of uh, housing units that could be built in that area under existing policy, basically the zoning that was set when the LCP was adopted in 1980, unless what's already been built. And that difference is an amount that's, that's theoretically available in that area for further housing development. And we re basically report that number out in that analysis, and that adds up with other housing opportunities around the unincorporated area. And in the aggregate, we've been able to show that the unincorporated area does have the potential to meet the housing goals that have been uh, established for uh, San Mateo County. Those 325 units, there's nothing new about that. That's based on policy that's been in place uh, since about 1980. I can understand uh, this, the housing element uh, in its entirety is a very complex document. Technically, Lisa's been working on that for a good couple of years now. There's a lots of analysis in there. And as a result, uh, ample opportunity for, for uh, misunderstanding. But those are not, that doesn't represent a policy change or any new development. That was simply an assessment and a tallying of what could, just in terms of the zoning, be developed under the existing regulations. Um, so that's where that number came from. It doesn't represent a change in policy. It's not part of anything that's uh, under consideration here as part of the LCP update. There's no plans afoot to add that level of development in El Granada. It's simply indicating if all the infrastructure was available and everything else was in place, no growth limits, no anything else, um, that's theoretically the amount of additional dwelling units that could be built in that multi multi-family area. I think we all know there are lots of constraints that would make that difficult. And not only, I, I was looking at the chart here, and I just as a, there's a listing here of uh, one column is multi-family units that I think would correlate to some degree with that area. There have been 31 units built over the last 23 years, so I don't think we're going to see uh, it's about 10% of that number in 20-some uh, years, uh, so we're not going to see that 325 happen anytime soon. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Jerry. Um, we've got potentially four more speaker slips. I'd like to call on Howard Lieberman to be followed by Jimmy Benjamin. Hello, I'm, I'm Howard Lieberman, and uh, I support the reduction to 1% growth. Last week, I was elected to the Mid Coast Community Council, so there's been some discussion about the workshop versus other kinds of factual things. I ran on a slow growth platform along with two of the prior speakers, Sarah and uh, Gail, and we were three out of the top four vote getters in the county, so I got about 900 votes saying yes, we would like slow growth. Um, it's very widely agreed by everybody uh, on both sides of this issue that we have a severe traffic problem, and it seems very clear to me that the, the growth rate of the traffic will be roughly proportional to the growth rate of the housing. So since we have a, a pretty big problem, it will only get worse. And the question is how accelerated that will be. Very simple. Thank you. Thank you. Jimmy Benjamin, followed by Chuck Kozak, and he's arrived. Uh, thank you, and good evening, commissioners. I apologize for uh, not being able to shake out a stamper until later this evening, so thanks for the chance to address you later tonight. Um, I read the, the comments and I've enjoyed the posters behind you. I like the Jeff's Noter neat and clean. Jeff Warshower is a writing machine. It's clear that he has excellent qualities for a secretary. And it sort of reminds me of the details of a planning document. They can be neat, all the dots can be kind of connected, and all the boxes can be checked. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the document makes sense. And in particular, I, I am very concerned about the 
uh, growth rates that are, are proposed that are uh, on the large side, uh, in my opinion. Uh, the, the comments on the housing element that uh, Mr. Burns just mentioned, in particular, uh, I, I would point just a slight embellishment on Mr. Lieberman's comments that if you add additional uh, traffic, additional homes, the traffic delays actually go up much faster than linear in the, in the number of cars. The delay actually rises at an exponential rate. So that is not a trivial increase. And I noted in this staff report the reference that a lower growth rate would allow the citizens in the mid coast and half moon bay to adjust more gradually to the additional traffic load. And I just wanted to remind the commission or ask that the commission may be inquired with their counsel, Ms. Rafferty, uh, sorry, Ms. Raftery, uh, concerning the Cortese Knox rule, which says that as half moon bay is in the sphere of influence, uh, sorry, as the mid coast is in the sphere of influence of half moon bay. Uh, the decisions that the uh, county makes with respect to growth in the mid-coast cannot cause Half Moon Bay to not be able to implement its general plan. Those would be fighting words. Now, I'm not a member of the city council. I, you know, I don't pretend to have a crystal ball and know what they do, but they've been very effective in the state and in courts recently, uh, protecting the rights of the Half Moon Bay citizenry not to be pushed around. And my respectful concern is that these growth rates especially those that are in excess of the urban core growth rates that Half Moon Bay is adopting of 1%, but even those that are somewhat lower because of the larger area involved and the total lack of, of job housing balance that has not been addressed, uh, at least to my satisfaction, in justifying these growth rates, uh, would cause a significant amount of traffic and severely impact Half Moon Bay's ability to meet its circulation element in particular. So I ask you to move to the low side of the absolute caps to remove these provisions that allow the Board of Supervisor to exempt certain kinds of development from growth caps and uh, make this responsive to the general plans and coherent planning that the Mid-Coast and Half Moon Bay need in order to be effective in planning for a sane development process on the Mid-Coast. If you've got the job to support that kind of housing, that's great. If they have to come through Half Moon Bay and Pacifica, I don't think you're being fair to them. You should keep those growth rates down. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm not seeing Chuck Kozak, so it appears to be just one more late speaker slip that was handed in um, about the water supply, which actually, before calling our last speaker, I am so thirsty that I am going to call a five-minute recess, and then we'll finish up the hearing and get on to our deliberation. Thank you. In fact, if the last slip mentioned water just made it... Uh, you come on me to get some right now. One more late speaker slip. But first of all, I'll call on uh, Bob. Uh, he just told me how to say his last name, and I'm afraid I'm going to butcher Pactel. Well, tell me the get it, tell me the right way. I'll never do that. Pat, I'm sorry. No problem. Uh, and I'll give your, your address to the record, too. I'm Bob Potasek, uh, 527 4th Street in Montero. I'm also um, director of the Montero Water and Sanitary District. I only want to come up with this subject matter of this water um, uh, supply. There was a statement made prior. All I want to do is correct it. And uh, so it's more of a clarification. <clears throat> there was a statement about um, there is no problem with water because there's water source available across from the airport. Um, and there are no domestic production water wells across from the airport. Uh, those are ag wells. Uh, if there are any, I believe there may be one or two ag wells. Uh, the other side of Highway 1, that's just on one a good source, um, is, is the same source as the um, airport wells on which we draw water and which is a, a source of the majority of citizens' complaints about the quality. Um, it takes a full EIR to convert it to ag well if you can to domestic. So you need to base your planning on the sources that you know rather than sources you're told might be there. Uh, you need to deal with the data and facts. That's all I want to do is correct that. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, and our last speaker will be Gene Van Dyke. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Thanks for letting me uh, slip in at the last year. 
Uh, well, first of all, I'm for the status quo. <clears throat> I don't think there should be a, a growth rate at all. Uh, and if there is a growth rate, I think it should be uh, based on an election, just like Catherine Bay. <coughs> uh, yeah, it's too serious of a subject not to have everybody uh, that lives here to have a, uh, a say in it. Uh, the other thing I was concerned about is in the data that we got tonight, in the, uh, the possible allocation between the communities, Princeton is not noted at all. And that's a community that has uh, basically commercial lots. There are a few residences in there, but the commercial lots in there are waterfront and uh, CCR. And on the CCR, you can have uh, mixed-use buildings. And, and those buildings usually have uh, components on the second floor with the bottom floor uh, with commercial, and you have uh, living units on the second floor. Uh, you also have, uh, in the waterfront area, uh, caretaker units, which are above commercial units. So if you, you include these two elements in your cap, uh, in, in, you're basically saying you're putting a cap on commercial. I mean, it's one, you know, you're, because you, these buildings are going to have these elements included with these buildings, the commercial aspect of it. Uh, and if you're going to put these in the, in the total, uh, pool or caps, automatically you're putting a cap on commercial. Uh, I've been trying to build in Princeton, I uh, got two small lots, or I've uh, been trying to build a small building in there for the last three years with two commercial units downstairs and two small studio apartments upstairs, 600 square feet each. This is, would be built, would be affordable housing for people in the area. But you know, if you're gonna put caps on these buildings, you're just eliminating the commercial downstairs too. So I just wanted to bring that point up. I think it's very important that you figure out uh, if you do allocate it, you do have a cap, where does Princeton fall into the situation? Uh, uh, the other little thing I wanted to say, I was at that last workshop that we discussed this. Uh, and I've heard a lot of complaints tonight, but for what I can remember, the majority of the people were residents, were locals, were property owners, not a bunch of constructors or contractors. And the, uh, the oh, I guess the last item I want to say is that uh, traffic. Yeah, there is traffic on the coast. Uh, and Mr. Silver, you're talking about you know, you base your decisions on evidence, and what evidence, what connects the two? I mean, certainly, um, there's a lot of reasons for the traffic. It's not just housing. Uh, so I take that into consideration. And when I get, you know, tied down in tra traffic, I don't look at it as a negative. I mean, it's kind of a positive, because we're going slower. I can enjoy the beauty all around me. So look at the positive. And, Please consider Princeton. That works everywhere but on the Bay Shore Freeway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank everyone for their input tonight. Uh, Mr. Kozak has not arrived and we'll, we've had our last speaker. I'd like to get a motion to uh, close the hearing. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, like to ask the staff if we could, just a number of speakers have mentioned the, the question of, of, of Princeton and where it comes in the allocation. I'd like to, to ask staff to comment um, on what the thinking was vis-a-vis -vis Princeton and how that would work out. Okay, um, I'd be happy to. As the last speaker had indicated, there's two forms of residential development that could be, would be permitted in Princeton. Neither of them are the primary use. One would be uh, in the mixed use setting where you, in the CCR district, commercial recreation, where you have a visitor serving commercial business on the ground floor and um, residential units above um, where the size of the residential units do not exceed the commercial. The other um, situation where there's residential in Princeton are caretaker quarters. 
both the issue of mixed units, uh, mixed use units, and caretaker quarters in terms of how they'll be regulated will be the subject of our next meeting in December. But in terms of what we're talking about tonight, um, the proposal is that all residential, at least staff's recommendation, and that of the Mid Coast Community Council, is that all types of residential units that are permitted by the LCP be subject to this quota. So uh, whether they are now or not, the proposal is single family resi residential units, multi-family residential units, mixed use units, uh, second units, and um, caretaker quarters, all the former residential units, all of them be subject to whatever limit you place, whether it be 125, 52, 80, whatever. Um, I was giving examples of breakdowns. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, jumping ahead. The alternative that's not on the screen, the one that distributes it amongst the communities. I was, I was showing. Those were but examples of if you if you cut it by these communities, here's what the percentages are. Because if your commission is inclined to include uh, to include mixed use units and. Um, Second, excuse me, mixed use units and caretaker quarters is being subject to the limit, and you also want to dis, uh, are endorsing a distribution formula. Then we would devise a distribution formula, a formula that would include those residential units that are allowed in Princeton. And uh, you've heard recommendations from speakers, like the last speaker, that you don't include um, mixed use units. You've heard other speakers from Princeton that said don't include caretaker quarters. You've heard speakers that say include everything, include even affordable housing units. Th those will be part of the part of your deliberations tonight. So in closing, um, if you, after you select a limit, if you also um, recommend that that limit be subject, uh, be uh, applied to all residential units, including caretaker quarters and mixed use units, and you support uh, a distribution formula, we could come back with a distribution formula that would include Princeton as well, where those types of units are allowed. George, I just want to clarify one thing. When you talked about the units included, you mentioned all types, but the recommendation from staff is to exclude units on the affordable, designated affordable housing sites. Thank you for that clarification. That's correct. We're carrying forward the existing exclusion. In the existing local coastal program policy, uh, the units on affordable housing sites are excluded. You've heard members of the audience say they should be included also, and you've also heard uh, members of the audience say exclude other things as well. But uh, Terry is correct, that is our recommendation. And I, I think that's a point of difference between the staff recommendation and the Coast Council, right? Um, it came out tonight as a point of difference. I don't think right. it was in the letter. Okay. The record to show that uh, Mr. Kozak made it back to shore safely, and I'm glad to see that he's uh, now on us. Give it to me. This is here for the hearing, public hearing portion of the meeting. I have a couple of comments yes, before sir. you start the delivery things that uh, are concerned to me that aren't addressed in the current staff report. They don't necessarily need to be addressed tonight, but I, depending on where we go with this, um, they, they could be an issue, and I just would rather speak to them now than later. Um, and those are two items. One is that the um, in res restricting growth through this type of a limitation, um, at some point, as the restriction becomes more uh, limiting, uh, we may need to deal with adoption of findings that support the um, the growth limit and uh, increase its, uh, uh, reduce its susceptibility to legal attack. I guess if you just would put that in one way to put it. Um, at some level, a, um, I see this as analogous to kind of a speed limit, really. And I think at, at some level, uh, we can understand in that analogy, people wouldn't really debate certain speed limits, they'd be perfectly adequate for everyone's purpose. But at, at some level, as you crank them down, people are going to start to raise arguments about their basic um, fairness and whether they allow them to uh, conduct their business around the community as they need to do. So at, at some level, 
And I'm not prepared to say that what level among these alternatives, because obviously as you go lower, um, it, it will be important to support a growth limit with some findings that address the rationale for the limit, the, um, the uh, sort of problems it's intended to address, and also that it makes some reasonable accommodation for um, the reasonable economic use of uh, individual property that the limit not become so restrictive that it, it calls that into question. And that might entail some analysis of that issue that, that hasn't yet been done. So if, if the commission is inclined to reduce the limit, can I recommend that to the Board of Supervisors or start that process in motion? Um, it would be helpful to know if you have any thoughts in that regard, what they are that would help us if we would work over the next few months to formulate those kinds of findings to support that kind of action as we bring the whole LCP update back in March. The second issue that concerns me is just a practical one. I think that Ann um, Kerry uh, addressed this pretty well in describing some of the issues that the City of Happen Bay has been dealing with, and that is that if, if we have a limit that um, is lower than sort of the natural rate of growth, so that in so that we regularly encounter um, a greater demand for development than we have a, a, an allocation available, we're going to deal with, need to deal with the practical way that gets resolved. So this is like uh, any other, you know, if you, if you uh, invite all your friends to a party and then they all show up and you look at the limit on the door and you've got 150 people there and the fire marshal said you can only have 100 people at the wedding, well, going to have to decide who comes in and who stays outside and, and have a way of explaining that to people and so this is similar to that. So we've only had to deal with that um, uh, one year that I recall since the LCP was adopted and it was, um, it was a difficult problem. Um, fortunately it was kind of transitory and, and very quickly the quota in, in the subsequent year there was room for people and it kind of took care of itself. But um, if that was an ongoing annual problem, then we're going to be, we're going to have a whole second set of problems, which is how do you allocate that scarce commodity that the building permit to uh, and make a decision about who, who is accommodated and who is not. And I, George covered in the report some of the different ways communities have tried to address that, but I, I don't know that there's a community um, Terry, Ter Ter just one second. I saw a hand up in the audience. Are you having difficulty hearing? No, I, I just objected. None of this was in the staff report. You're raising something totally outside the scope of the staff report. No one had a chance to address this problem. We could easily have addressed it if it was brought up in advance. Half of Bay easily dealt with these issues. It's not um, fair. I, no, I'm not here. Our point is, though, that I, uh, I'd still like to hear what Terry has to say. And and I want to be clear, I'm not trying to influence the choice here. I'm just saying as the person responsible for administering these problems, I don't want to be in the position of uh, a year or two down the road um, uh, raising these kinds of issues at that point. I think we need to be thinking ahead. I think all these problems could be solved, but there is uh, a set of issues that flow from this that I just wanted to be sure we're we're out on the table now rather than being brought up later. I think there'd be equal arguments later that, that why wasn't this brought up earlier, you know? So um, uh, I don't think it argues to the basic decision to be made. I think that should be made on the what's the right growth rate for the community. But in some of these scenarios, that issue would not arise. And in others, I think it would become a, uh, uh, an issue that the county would need to address. <coughs> Well, a number of times earlier today, I said, what's the pleasure of the commission? Um, and certainly, if we do desire to reopen the hearing or ask specific questions related to specific points, we could do so, but I don't want to do that lightly. Commissioner, oh, I see to my left, there's no microphone, so I don't need to be denied anyone's right to speak. Uh, Commissioner Bomberger, having thoroughly grasped the microphone, I'm hoping you're about to speak. So. I guess 
in listening to someone. Am, am I on? I just have to hold it closer. Um, as I as I listen back to uh, some of the previous meetings when we were talking about infrastructure, I would look at our current situation here on the coast side as it is in the rest of the county as we're rushing to a train wreck. And so um, my interest would be in getting there as slowly as possible in the hopes that something might intervene to prevent it. Something in the planning process, something in the infrastructure process, or whatever, or maybe even um, more interesting changes in the general plan and the zoning. But in any case, uh, I really am uh, in favor of uh, growth limitations. Be because of that, I, I just don't see why we should get to the train wreck faster. Uh, what, what I've been puzzling through um, as I've been listening is some um, how to deal with some discussions we've had way early over here in the coast when we were dealing with um, the need for affordable housing. You know, and, and I can remember a um, broad spectrum of the community asking us to provide for affordable housing. Um, I think there was some discussion the last time we were through this that, that affordable housing be meaningful to the community and actually provide opportunities for uh, firemen and police and, and people to have a place to, to buy and live in. One of the things you can do with uh, general plan policies is to cause things to happen that you want to have happen. And what, what concerns me about um, the affordable housing element is that if you really want that to happen, you have to recognize that we have a couple of sites on the county, on the coast side, where that's been designated to happen. And that's not going to happen in those sites, one house this year and one house next year. It's going to happen because somebody comes in, sees an opportunity to build a project, and if we do things really well, that project will be meaningful to the community. That being the case, it really does not make sense to include those in this limitation if our interest is in having that happen. So, I, and I'm sorry we didn't have, you know, enough, you know, just more people address that particular issue as we were talking about the limitation, but, um, I guess I'm getting way ahead of myself. I'm looking for some kind of limitation, but my bias right at the moment is not to include the affordable housing sites in that limitation, simply because we want it to happen. Well, I, I, I thought they were to be excluded. I thought that was a proposal. Well, we've had some other people talking about they wanted to be included, and so oh, I'm just... I don't agree with that. Oh, okay, well then there's two of them. Just to clarify, um, the existing LCP policy does exclude the affordable uh, units on the affordable housing sites. The staff recommendation is to continue that exclusion, although you had her, her testimony tonight not to include, not to have that exclusion. I'm sorry, I, 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 I just couldn't hear you, George. Okay. The existing LCP policy has the exclu excludes units on the affordable housing sites. This, the staff recommendation is to also is to continue that exclusion. However, the reason it's an issue is because speakers tonight have brought up the, have brought up the concept of not excluding those units and including them uh, as part of whatever limit you set on. I'm still trying to think of which is the correct unit. So I'd be interested to hear what other people have to say. Well, I'm, I'm just going to say what, what I am in favor of. And that is that applying the Apple Bay's 1% growth rate. And under no circumstances should the annual growth rate exceed the historical rate of 52 units per year. 
and uh, to distribute the uh, number of new units among the Midfield community according to their growth potential, uh, the remaining and uh, following ones weren't suggested in farming courses. And that uh, second units and caretakers quarters should definitely be counted. And uh, eliminating the Board of Supervisors' uh, uh, ability to uh, increase seeds of rates. It's essentially the Midcoast Community Council with the uh, adding of the uh, confirming units. Thank you, Commissioner Noble. Um, I, I still have not not clear in my head regarding the Princeton issue. We are discussing the Princeton issue in the next meeting. Then, am I clear that then the the gentleman that allows me to talk about the mixed use and the caretaker quarter at, the, at Princeton is not part of this, well, whatever limitation that we are planning to set. Let me make it simple. At the next meeting, you will be discussing what types of residential units will be allowed at Princeton. What you're discussing tonight is whatever you decide at the next meeting in terms of types of residential units, um, do you include those units in this cap? in this cap. So right now, mixed use units are allowed in the CCR district. Moving ahead, we're recommending that that continue. Uh, caretaker quarters are allowed in the W district. Moving ahead, we're recommending that that continue at the existing limitations. You're going to hear testimony for uh, uh, loosening limitations. However, what relates to tonight is Whatever form those units are allowed in Princeton, should they be counted in this limit or not? The question tonight is, should caretaker quarters be included in the, in the limit on residential units? Staff recommendation is yes. The other thing is, should mixed use units be, allowed, uh, be counted um, in the limit on number of residential units per year? Staff recommendation is yes. However, you heard testimony from the last speaker that that could hypothetically lead to a situation where He's prevented from building his commercial unit because he, there isn't any room, uh, there isn't any more of the quota left for residential units. But anyway, um, what's before you tonight is, are those types of units going to be subject to the limit? What's before you next week are the limitations on those type of units, you know, their size, how many of them do we allow, that type of thing. Okay, so, so I am clear that the, whatever we decide at the next meeting regarding the Princeton community, is part of this limitation, this limit, this number that we're deciding tonight. Because I'm not clear. Okay, okay. Basically, I guess the question is, do you, what you should decide tonight is, do you want caretaker quarters to be included in this limit? Next week, you'll decide if you're even going to have caretaker quarters out there. But if you do, do you want them to be allowed in this limit? The other thing, tonight you're going to decide, do you want mixed use units to be included in this uh, limit. Next week you'll decide if you're even going to have big units. We're recommending that you do. So the really tonight is what you're deciding is if you have these units, which they are permitted now, are they to be included in this limit? That's what's before you tonight. And that's kind of embodied, I guess, in number three in my recommendation, which says apply the annual growth rate limit to all residential units except the, on, on the designated uh, affordable housing sites. That means, that is, it includes single family units, multiple family units, second units, mixed use units, and caretaker quarters. If you endorse that, next week you'll be talking about, or at the next meeting, what size will the caretaker quarters be, uh, how many of them will we, uh, how fast will we allow them to be generated. I mean, nothing related to tonight. So basically, what you decide tonight is should those types of units be included in this limit? Well, George, just to clarify one thing you've said a couple of times, meeting next week, no, just so no one gets the wrong day. No, when will that meeting be? It's going to be on December 10th. I think. Okay, so next month. Next month. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, guess, I guess the confusion part I have is one of your recommendations is, is it talks about uh, allocation of this should be the annual resident, of the resident growth to the risk of annual open and 
Wanted to leave a number of vacant parcels in each community. And, and what you have here on this sheet, it doesn't mention about Princeton. That's, you're correct. That was meant as an illustration. If you proceed with the distribution formula, we would make sure that every area where we're counting units, we would have that worked into the distribution formula. So we'd, we'd either come back in March with right. one of those formulas, in which case Princeton would be probably grouped in with perhaps El Granada, or Princeton might be broken out separately. I think the uh, the issue there is it's it's a very small area with a very limited num amount of residential development. But if you have any preference in that tonight, we'd be glad to, to work on that as we move forward. As with the other tasks, tonight we're taking what amounts to a tentative action to select among the all the alternatives that have been discussed, and then staff will use your direction that you provide tonight to develop more detailed proposals to implement this. We'll return with those in March along with all the other tasks. And um, so really what we're looking for tonight is a, a rather general level. If you want to do that distribution formula, then we can um, uh, break Princeton out separately or group it in with other communities. No, I, I, no that, I don't need that tonight. I'm just trying to clarify what I'm... Right, and that was... Tonight, I, should, know, I should have been clear. That there, was only meant as an illustration. I was not uh, asking you to, to uh, endorse those numbers. I was just trying to show you the concept of how if you cut by population, it would break down this way if you cut by this. And so this was just illustrative. And these are the communities that we kind of historically talk about out here, but you know there are many sub-communities and neighborhoods that could be a finer breakdown of this seal code. You know, there's a lot of little areas here and there, but these are the ones, that this goes back to Grant Pollard worked years ago on the, among others on the, was, I think it was called the Montero Moss Beach El Granada Community Plan or something like that. So, um, okay. Um, thank you. Well, I, you know, it's interesting every time you come to make a decision on this issue, on this task, uh, we, we're going to piss off somebody, we're going to get somebody mad, one, one side or the other. Uh, and, and, and one of the speakers talked about, you know, we wish we you know, wish have smart growth. Uh, and and I, I, I tend to agree with that. But I, I think what, what, what I look at is what's good planning. You know, what, what is good planning? Uh, and, and, then, and then look at, well, where the 125 unit came about and then also allowing the Florida supervisor to move up to you. Uh, to go up to 200 units. My, my feeling is on, on this issue or on this task is, and because I'm a, you know, nut and bolt type of guy, and, and, and based on the, the, the average of the last 21, 21 years of what happened, where the, the 52 unit number comes about, uh, that's that's a number that I would agree on. That um, to limit the the unit to uh, from 125 to 52. But I'm not comfortable sitting here saying that if something number 53 comes in for that year and he can't get his perk for that year. So because of that. I have no problem, and actually glad to do this, that give that authorization to the board of supervisors to be able to raise that annual vote to up to 80. Uh, based on the number looking here, the only time that we either went up to past 80 was only 1998. So it was only one year. And most of them resolved somewhere within 40, no 40, actually it's 50. Pretty well after 50. So uh, that's what I would uh, propose and, and, and vote for. Uh, I, and then with that, I have no problem of agreeing to counting the, the second unit, the next unit, and the caretaker order with all that. So 
and then that is part of the reason why I asked regarding about the Princeton, is that part of this whole count limit and all that stuff? So if it is, I think we should try to give a little leeway and, and make sure that that, you know, that everybody is taken care of, so every, that everybody get that opportunity. So that, that would be my feeling. Um, thank you. Um, before the hearing and before coming over here tonight, I really had very mixed feelings about uh, rate restriction use. It seems to me it's, it's important sometimes it's where we end up, end up ultimately is how quickly we get there. But As, as I was saying, I've, I've often felt that it's more important ultimately where we're going to arrive and how quickly we get there. But uh, I'm persuaded by what Commissioner Bomberger said that if we're heading to uh, uh, an ultimate goal, that the wisdom of which seems uncertain, perhaps getting there a bit more slowly makes sense. And certainly that's what we did coming here tonight. We got there more slowly, I'd say. Um, at least the core of the Planning Commission that I was writing with traveled through traffic condition and F on the way here. I'm certainly somewhere in between E and F. And I have no reason, and this isn't the only time that this has happened to us coming over to these hearings. I, I don't think there's anything exceptional going on tonight. And... Something about 5.30. Yeah, it's called rush hour. It's called peak traffic. And, um, it, it, it does make me think that at least getting to the goal of overdeveloping the coast a little bit more slowly while we work out some solutions that may involve uh, whether it's infrastructure solutions or changes in the old but amount of development we allow, but at least that there's something to be said for that. Um, I do think that it makes sense to examine uh, the uh, designated uh, housing uh, designated affordable housing sites, um, as is the case currently, the staff is recommending, and um, any modifications. I could even see going farther and having a two-tiered growth rate with with uh, treating the portable units that are developed in other than this sites prefer, uh, with, with preferential treatment, but I do think if we have a growth limitation that is low enough that it may actually get bumped into occasionally, then we do have to come back and as part of our uh, wrapping this up, have to look at some way of allocating those units that of course could be a lot of them, but it also could be based on a ranking, some type of ranking system, and affordability could be part of that ranking system. So that's something I would be interested in. Uh, and looking at uh, early next year when, when this comes back to us for completion. But I, uh, based on what I've heard tonight and what I've seen coming over to the coast, and really what's been an extended field trip and traveling to many of these hearings through rush hour traffic, um, I'm convinced that uh, something close to the 1% limit that's uh, endorsed by the mid uh, Mid Coast Council um, makes sense. I guess one of the things that uh, occurs to me, and I, I think we may want to put it in one of the things we think about when we're doing wrap up. Uh, after we've looked at some more of the elements. Um, if you're looking at uh, a smart growth model and an interest in increasing commercial and job generating uh, development in this particular area, which of course runs somewhat counter to trying to eliminate traffic, but we've discussed that before, uh, it may make sense to consider excluding uh, mixed-use development from this, although I, 
I think before I would do that, I would want to look more closely at what that what that represents in terms of potential, uh, in terms of uh, adding to the growth rate before move forward with that. I'd, I'd certainly be uh, sympathetic to considering removing that. Uh, and it would seem to me that based on what we'll hear in December, that that's the kind of issue that we could handle in some kind of wrap up. But the city staff has currently, is currently recommended to include everything at the decline for now to proceed on that basis. Well, but knowing that um, we're proceeding with a mind that's, to say the least, very open about changing that, I also would feel that if, uh, for instance, mixed use were to be an issue in Princeton, and Princeton is included in a larger area in any kind of allocation system, that uh, that a commercial development being held up with a lack of one um, one mixed use unit would be much less likely that Princeton were given its own very tiny allocation. Probably would not be a good idea to would be too inflexible. Um, one, one other issue that I just occurs to me, uh, Leonard Warren recommended uh, allocating uh, or distri distributing the uh, uh, units under whatever growth rate we have on the, on the number of not just vacant parcels, but vacant conforming parcels. We've had no, I think Commissioner Nobles expressed interest in doing that. Uh, I'd like to get some, if we are to pursue that, I'd like to get and I'm not necessarily advocating it, but I'd like to have some idea from, from staff as to what what kind of effect that would have and whether it, what's to be said about the pros and cons and the reasonableness of that approach. Um, I'm you know, certainly open to considering it, but I don't have a strong feeling one way or the other. Well, George? I'm to the staff, and based on my comments, maybe Mary uh, may have something to say. If I understand um, the point that was made during testimony, uh, it was requested uh, that when the, if there was a proposal to, or if your commission endorsed distributing the limit, that when you have the distribution ratios, the percentages, it only applied to vacant conforming parcels. What initially, or what immediately came to mind in my point is, it seems like that uh, came to mind for me is, is this a de facto prohibition? Because if, when you distribute them, this allotment, and then you've closed off the non-conforming parcels, and we've had county councils say that non-conforming parcels on developed on standard size lots or legal lots are uh, appropriate building sites, and then they, they get caught in a, you know, a de facto prohibition when, when you're distributing the a lot, but it seemed like some legal issues are raised. So that's why. Uh, you know, George, I, I have a different reaction to that, I guess, and maybe <laughs> see what Leonard meant, but um, more importantly, probably what the commission means. But the, um, I just, what I saw was rather than counting all vacant parcels as the baseline, what we're talking about is each community gets a percentage of the growth limit based on some factor. And so what I was assuming was going on there was that instead of counting all parcels in the base and in each community share of the base, you just count standard parcels. And then the percentage would be based on that. It wouldn't have anything to do with whether any particular type of parcel was buildable or not. If that's the case, then I miss I miss And I imagine the distribution, you guys know better than I do, the people in the community, but I would guess the distribution of standard parcels in the mid coast is probably a little different than the distribution of all parcels. There are some communities that have many, many substandard lots, if not most, and then others that have uh, uh, fewer. So I, I, I think it was merely a matter of how those ratios get calculated and that it would steer development, um, I think, probably toward the communities which have more standard lots. But if that was what was intended, I, I retract my earlier comments and, and I share with you. But I think that's up yeah, to the commission. As long as I was, I've got this in my hand, I've been trying to, a little bit like we did this afternoon, um, we were able to break down the um, inclusionary zoning issue into some components. And I think the key things in this decision tonight 
are the basic rate of growth you're going to recommend to the Board of Supervisors, the, uh, you know, the status quo 125, the 80, the 52, the 1 percent, the 30. Whether you want the Board to have any flexibility, as they currently do, to exceed that rate in certain circumstances and to what degree, whether we will continue to exempt affordable housing sites from that limitation, the development on those sites, whether we would include all other types of residential development or exclude some of that, and then is there going to be a further breakdown of the limit on some sort of geographic allocation among the, the, the various communities in the mid coast, or are we just going to have a single overall limit? So if that, I'm just trying to help focus this bit this bit and, and move towards some kind of a recommendation from the board. I think what I was starting to hear was the 1% rate was recommended by the Mid-Coast Council. Um, there seems to be some interest in leaving the board with some flexibility to adjust that, uh, at least on the part of some commissioners. There seems to be some emerging agreement on exempting the affordable housing sites to tentatively include all other residential development with a possible reconsideration of mixed units in Princeton after the, the discussion on December 10th. And uh, I'm a little unclear on the geographic, the further geographic uh, breakdown of the overall limit. I'd like to add that while we've heard some, some commissioners endorse the 1% limit, uh, Commissioner Wong, or endorse the historic rate 52 percent with the opportunity for the board to raise it to 80 percent if infrastructure was available. Thank you, 80 units. I should say. Yeah. Um, to to try to move this forward, um, I got a question on regarding the Mid Coast Community Council recommendation. On, on, on second part, second bullet, it is circumstantial and annual goal. Does that mean, so if it's 38, then it just all going to go up to 52? Yeah. Or does it, there's a mechanism that they have? Uh, I kind of had the same question, because I, I think that could be read as either, um, we, we really like 1%, but if you don't, then the most we could go for is 52, or it could have been read to mean that the, the normal limit would be 1%, but there should be some flexibility to go up to 52 under certain circumstances, and I think the commissioner is asking. Uh, if, if I could. Could you open Chuck since he was presentation, how he's here? Well, let me, let me try to open. If you have one unit or limit, and are 3,800 units now. So in the first year, it's going to be 38 units. The next year, it's going to be 38 and a half, and then it's going to be 39, and then 40. And the question is, do we actually get to 52 within the 20-year planning period, or is that uh, a, a non-issue? But it, it's true that if you adopt the 1%, at some time close to build out, you might build the last last 52 houses in, in one year. Isn't build out about 6,300 So the last year you might get 63. Well, somewhere you're going to have 5,200 units. So one, one way to read this is there's one percent, but it reach, reaches the ceiling uh, with the. Uh, I think I would like to ask a question of clarification, and Mr. Kozak, since you weren't here to speak, I'm not inviting you to, to reopen the topics that we've already gone through. But just to clarify, what was the intent uh, of stating one percent? which we understand now is around is, is roughly 38 units, but not to ever exceed 52. Um, I see you getting many cases out there. <laughs> That's not what I'm asking. Um, yeah, the, um, the idea of 
there uh, basically as we have written in our original uh, comments was under any planning scenario uh, never allow the angle uh, uh, growth the number of units on the coast to exceed the historic rate of 52 and that was based mainly on um, the fact that this, this appears to be um, the maximum tolerable rate to deal with in terms of no, so if, if one percent would exceed 52, have 52 be an absolute. 52 would be a cap. Yeah, I see. No, it was not with the idea that there'd be a one percent limit, which right now is 38, but that there'd be some type of, of a fudge factor between there and the 52. But the 52 was meant to be a ceiling. Once one percent reaches two or would exceed it, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So one percent until you get to 52, and then you stay there. Okay, with with that. Um, I, I can want to go along with that if we does not do not count the the mixed use in the, in, in the caretaker corner. The reason I, I'm saying that is, I, as I recall, one of the testimony from somebody, one of the speakers, that saying that that was only about one and a half or close to two percent of the whole all the build out. So we're not we're not talking about a lot of numbers on that. That's how you call it, so. Well, certainly so we look on our, our page seven of our memorandum and we look at existing, and George, correct me if I'm wrong in going to this table that I think speaks to just what Commissioner Wong is saying, attaining LCP build out on page seven, existing nine caretakers quarters, build out 21, so we're talking about 12 more. Mixed use existing, well, this would, of course, the 99 could it could exist. Well, let me explain. But, yeah. Let me, the, the reason I have an asterisk there is, it's a property owner's decision when, when you're in a where we allow mixed use. We're allowing the primary district would allow a commercial or non-residential use. The it becomes a, the property owner's option whether to uh, propose a residential unit. Theoretically. You could have no more mixed-use units, and everybody just builds commercial. Also, you could have the other ex and, uh, end of the spectrum, where theoretically you could have every every property owner build mixed-use above a commercial, and every commercial space had a mixed-use, and then that would raise it up to 499. I think if I indicate on my uh, oh, I didn't include the number, but the number with the asterisks is greater than 450. So. We didn't. I did not include a fixed number because that's a that's a variable number. We could have we could have no more mixed use because it's not required, or we could have all mixed use. And it's, so it, when I did the build out, I did not really. So I used it used the existing number of units because we know that's how many build out units right. are there. It's only speculative or how many build out how many mixed use units you would have. But potentially, out. potentially, you're saying it could be over 450. Yes. If, if I, uh, Commissioner Wong, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe you were kind of responding to the concerns of the Princeton community. And uh, there are other locations where mixed, mixed use development can occur. And so I would, if it's, if it's consistent with what you intended, you, you, you might suggest exempting caretaker quarters and mixed unit mixed use units in Princeton, but not elsewhere. I don't think, um, uh, you know, ex excluding from this count, residential units developed, uh, multifamily units developed, say in the Princeton, in the uh, El Granada commercial area, I think would be a whole separate issue. I don't think that's what was in and, and, I, and I do agree with you, Jay, that is basically what I'm looking at. Uh, based on what, George has mentioned regarding about the possibility of the mixed use going to 400 some units, then I, I, I would like to, willing to accept that, as I said, that the 1% growth and up to 52 maximum, and then exclude the uh, mixed use unit and can't take a quarter of the Princeton area only, but do count those on the other area. So uh, I'm willing to move forward on that. If, if move forward means make that as a motion, uh, could I, could maybe I, we can get a second. Is it uh, Terry one? 
if that's kind of the direction we're headed in, maybe we could just clarify a couple of other issues here. So I'm hearing the Midcoast Council's recommendation with regard to the basic rate understood to mean 1% annually until the number reaches 52 and then 52 thereafter. Um, that you would continue to exempt the affordable housing sites designated, the residential development on the designated affordable housing sites. You would include all other residential units with the exception of mixed use and caretaker quarters in Crimson. And then from my point of view, there's there are two other fundamental questions. Do you want the Board of Supervisors to have any flexibility beyond the 1% slash 52 limit in any sort of circumstance? And secondly, do you want to break that down, the roughly 38 units, say, in the immediate future, up to 52 units in later years? Do you want to break that down further among the communities on some sort of geographic distribution? So I think that I have two further questions. Should the board have any continued flexibility to increase the limit under whatever circumstances you define? And should there be a geographic distribution of that limit? That's good. Uh, I'm going to take a shot at this. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, my motion would be to adopt the 1% uh, full rate and that under no circumstances shall the annual will rate limit really exceed the historical rate to 52 minutes as the Co estimate Coast Council, a committee council recommend. Um, exclude the affordable housing site unit and also exclude the mixed use unit and the care to the quarter in the Princeton area only and to uh, accept the staff staff recommendation on number four of, that is clarified that the quote weight limit applied to the number of residential and not to the number of building permits except also the staff recommendation on number two the allegated allegated to pursue the uh, Annual residential road rate limit among the Big Coast community according to the relevant number of vacant parcels in each community, i.e., over 10. And to allow the Board of Supervisors to authorize, to direct the Planning Commission to come back on the growth. Uh, I like this. To, to reconsider the, um, the, the allow how many units we have allowed to build per year, either up or down based on the, the infrastructure of the mid coast uh, community. So that would include. Uh, if, if there's a change on the, on Highway One or Ninety Two, there's uh, the change in the water or system or a bit of, of the, uh, somebody mentioned we're talking about school. So, as a clarification, would it be that the Planning Commission would recommend to the Board of Supervisors that uh, the limit of one percent up to fifty-two? Could be increased by a specified amount, and then we can specify that. Is that part of your motion? Can you see suggesting? It sounded no. to me like you're suggesting you come back to us if there were changes in conditions. Okay, so it, so basically, it come back to you for discussion. There would never be language that authorizes uh, an increase to, by a fixed amount. Just that if if there was to be consideration of an adjustment. We would start a new item to have discussions at the planning commission. Um, I'm, I'm wondering. I'm just. I can see the discussion of this provision getting complicated. If if it makes sense you want to, leave to that out? leave that out for now, see if we can get a second motion, act on that, and then come back and discuss the 
pot whether we wish as a commission to uh, have an exception procedure of some type. I'm, I'm willing to do that. Oh, there is that. And I, and I would recommend in your discussion that you also uh, discuss uh, the part of that distribution if you were. I think what that number of vacant parcels or the number of vacant parcels. What I heard is, uh, I think Commissioner Wong in his motion included what was the staff recommendation number two, which is to allocate and distribute the annual residential growth right. rate limit among mid coast communities according to the relative number of vacant parcels. So that, I interpret that as conforming and non conforming. That's, okay, that, that's correct. That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. Okay, then that's fine. So, yeah, at least as I understand the motion, it's parcels, period. So it include both conforming and non-conforming. I, and I think I heard a second of the motion. Is that Stan, Commissioner Barber? I heard a second. Okay, discussion on the motion. Uh, I, have, I have a question on the, on the motion. Does this uh, not come back before the planning commission, but does the Board of Supervisors uh, have the ability to uh, in, increase the number? Not, not on the, th that's something we're going to discuss next. Right. I will draw this that part of the motion. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, should, would it, I, I think I understand what it is, but it would be helpful for just to, yeah, what I heard, what I heard the motion and Commissioner Wong or Commissioner Bomber to correct me if I'm wrong in, in my understanding of this, is the motion is to uh, adopt the 1% uh, growth limit, but that is not to exceed, the growth be limited to 1%, but not to exceed 52 units per year, it would be the lower of those two. Uh, that this epi growth be allocated according to the staff recommendation number two, which I just described, which is uh, the number of, relative number of vacant parcels in each community. Um, that the annual growth rate applied to all residences. That this essentially was in the staff recommendation under number three and number four uh, as well. That the, uh, the growth rate would apply to the number of residential units, not the number of building permits. And uh, further, that uh, caretakers units and mixed use units in Princeton, Princeton area would be exempted from this. Um, I think that's it. That's it. Yeah. Uh, and any, any, if there's no further discussion, then I'm all, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. It's unanimous. Now the, the question is, do we wish to try to craft an exception procedure uh, whereby the board or the board with the planning commission's esteemed advice could authorize overriding that growth rate under any, under circumstances without amending the uh, let me ask the council a question. Maybe I don't need to make that motion. Does, does the board of supervisors have that power to direct the planning commission to go come back and look at this um, limit of unit being built per year if they find that you know after the the test of the uh, of the water and the well and and, and then the, the expansion of Highway One on Fifth One Ninety Two. You know, any improvement that they can direct us and say, well, we want you to meet and look at this issue again? Um, it would, I'm a little confused by the question, but if, if you're asking whether we could build in a craft of provision that would say that the um, Board of Supervisors authorize the Planning Commission to increase the well, not to, 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 or, or to, to restudy to re uh, theoretically that could be included but I guess the question is why would why would you do it because the, well, at any time the board of supervisors could ask the that's what I thought. commission to restudy that's what I thought. If, if basic circumstances change significantly uh, the, the board could direct the planning, the planning staff and the commission to reopen this area. That that's different from building in an automatic uh, uh, something that can be uh, changed with a less thorough procedure. And I think what I'm hearing from Commissioner 
Wong is that if that basic authority is there, and what I'm hearing from our council, if that basic authority is there to, if, if the fundamental circumstances have changed and maybe it makes sense to change this plan, we can come back and do that at a later time. The boards could certainly so direct without us building in a specific procedure for that. Good. Thank you. Then I can up to the bottom. I, if I'm not mistaken, we may have completed our action on this. Is there anything we're overlooking? Hey, clarification is that it is part of the motion to delete the board ability. We did not include it. We did not include it. We so didn't. It would well, not be a part of the new policy. Okay, so we currently, it is a part of the new policy, so your recommendation is to the board of service to delete the existing policy. Well, well you certainly, the, the current policy is for a limit of 100, 125 that can go up to 200. Right, the part in the, there's a part of the policy that says that the board can raise it to 200, and so when we pass this on, if this goes forward and we pass it on to the board, your recommendation is to delete the ability of the board to raise it to 200. That was my understanding. Okay. Is that? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were. No, it's fine. To I, me down. I think um, just to be clear about this, the uh, there is a policy on the books that allows the board to adjust this to 200 units per year. And I think what would be helpful, and that George is identifying, is if that's not your intention, that you have a motion to delete that policy at minimum. And then I was the only thing I was going to point out. Um, I was just doing a few calculations here. The staff recommendation number five on the on the sort of white sheet here talks about um, if it were retained, keep the same ratio of growth limit to flexibility. And I just did those numbers very quickly. And if you applied the same ratio, we have 125 to 200 to the uh, 38 limit and then the eventual 52 limit, you end up with numbers of 61 and 83. So if you had a correlating, if you kept the provision like this in place but reduced it downward, essentially the same amount you're reducing the, the regular growth limit, instead of the board having the flexibility to increase this to 200, it would be a flexibility to increase this somewhere between 61 and 83. But if, if you don't want to do that, then I think George has a good point. You should just have a simple motion to delete that provision from the proposal. Just so we're, we can communicate that clearly and proceed on that basis. I, but in, in the interest of proceeding, I would move that we delete that provision. Second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. This was to, to delete the provision that would give the board the authority to exceed the authorized vote. Oh, yeah. And then we had a vote to vote. Yeah, motion and second. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So just to uh, look ahead briefly, so we are going to take this LCP update up again on December 10th. Candy or George, maybe you can help me. That'll be in Redwood City. Yes, that's fine. That's the and it's in the afternoon. Yes. So I think it's 2 p.m. And the general subject will be three tasks, but the unifying theme amongst all three tasks are we'll be talking about residential uses in non-residential zone districts. So oh. like residences in commercial areas, caretaker quarters in wa waterfront areas, houses in the COSC. Those are the issues, issues we'll be talking about. So December 10th, 2 p.m., Board of Supervisors Chambers in Redwood City. And, and I believe we made a decision earlier this afternoon that we're going to have a field trip to yeah. Princeton prior to that. The commission um, received a request from the Princeton Citizens Advisory Committee to take a tour of Princeton in advance of that meeting. Um, the commission uh, felt that would be useful. That is going to be organized as a planning commission field trip. Um, we're going to seek input from both the Princeton Citizens Advisory Committee and the Mid Coast Community Council about what we should see in Princeton. And um, we'll organize a schedule accordingly. Commissioner um, Wong requested that we start um, early enough in the afternoon so that we could be going home before that magic hour of 5 or 5.30. So we'll, we'll probably 
and being over here around 2 p.m. somewhere in or near Princeton. We'll work all that out. And we'll, I think we'll be looking at about an hour to an hour and a half at the most um, uh, progress through Princeton. We may drive certain places and walk others, and uh, we'll be organizing that. George will be working with, with the uh, PCAC and the Mid-Coast Council and see what might be included in that. And we'll try to be inclusive. So if somebody wants to see A and someone else wants to see B, we'll probably go look at both. So that would be most likely on Monday, December 8th in the afternoon. I'd like to thank everyone very much, both the public and our staff. There's that tonight. All in favor? Aye.